Hello. This is uh, another fight site panel roundtable discussion. Uh, I got a really interesting topic today with some really interesting people. This panel is going to be about toughness and what that means in the context of combat sports and what we're applying it to and why we're talking about it. All of those questions will be answered. Uh, but here to discuss that with us, we have some pretty qualified candidates. There's me, I'm Ed, I run the fights. So I'm not really qualified to speak about it, but I had the idea, so I get to be here. Um, we also have Zach Makovsky, uh, MMA veteran, uh, MMA world champion, Division One wrestler, very tough guy, uh, very handsome guy. And how, how are you doing today, Zach? I'm doing well. Look at him. I don't know how, I don't know how tough I am, but definitely handsome. Yes. Do the wink. Do the Indis wink. Indisputable. <laughs> <laughs> And we also have uh, Tuman, who has outed himself by changing his name on Twitter, but we can still call him Miggy if he wants. I mean, just use whatever. Actually, like the name Tuman, I mean, it, it kind of implies like some kind of there's some things going on with that. But but no, I'm actually one man. I wouldn't understand. It's not <laughs> it's not a white people thing. <laughs> And we also have uh, Haxorize, who uh, is too scared to show his beautiful face. I know he's handsome. I know he is. He just won't show us. Uh, but he is here, and he is awake, and we finally got him. We nailed him down. He's here to speak about toughness. How you doing, man? Well, you know, just getting ready to see how many fights that make Ed cringe we can fit into this as examples. <laughs> A lot of different things make me cringe, so that shouldn't be hard. But yeah, so the discussion topic is toughness. Uh, how we arrived at this is, I don't remember. I'll be honest, I don't remember how we got here, but I, I, I put the idea forth a while ago. We've been tossing it around for a few months, and uh, there wasn't really like a planning process that made it take this long. I'm just really bad at figuring out time zones, so we couldn't schedule it properly. But uh, thankfully, Tuman uh, used his brain, which is much better than mine and got us all in the same place at the same time. So thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate mean, it. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be too complimentary of my brain thinking ability because yesterday I got up at 5 p.m. and was like really panicking because I was really concerned about missing the whole thing. And then my genius plan was to get shit-faced and then go to sleep at a reasonable hour. And I, in, the, in, in practice, I ended up getting shit-faced and going to sleep at 6 a.m. So if you're wondering why I look all bloated and terrible and gross, then there's your answer. And he still showed up. That's toughness. That's the podcast. <laughs> All right, see you, folks. Just kidding. All right. So this topic, yeah, it, it's one that that comes up for me a lot. That that I've had a lot of time to think about. Uh, writing about amateur wrestling and MMA, probably objectively two of the toughest things you can do uh, from an athletic perspective, and wrestling in particular uh, from an American perspective. Toughness is one of the core tenets. It's a virtue in wrestling. It's something that is expected of you when you're, when you're part of a team. Uh, what that means, we'll get into a lot, I'm sure. How it can be a virtue, how it can be good, how it can be something desirable, how it can be something destructive and unhealthy. And in MMA, I think it has a much more simplistic uh, role because people are getting punched in the head. And usually if someone's good at getting punched in the head where they continue to fight while they're getting punched in the head, they're like, oh, that guy's tough. Um, or you know, you could use it in a more broad term where someone's good. Or so like in a, in a wrestling sense, a wrestling culture, I always say like, oh yeah, that guy's tough. If he's like hard to beat, if he's good. Oh yay, he's using the reactions. That's nice. I don't know if you can see that in the recorded call, but if you if you do see the reactions, uh, just ignore them. Uh, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so th these topics have come up for me a lot. And um, basically the reason I wanted to discuss it is because I think with regard to MMA specifically, uh, we need to come to terms with some more concrete definitions. I don't think we're ever going to get down a perfect, like, this is toughness, uh, and here's when it's good, here's when it's bad, and here are the different levels of it type of definition. But I think we need to lay some things out, you know, get some pet peeves out of the way, do some complaining, uh, and, and, and lend some personal experiences, not me, but everyone else will, uh, about what it means. And, and we'll try to, to lead somewhere productive in terms of, like, can it be taught? Can it be learned? How, where does it come from? Uh, types of things. So uh, for me, uh, something that I hope to get back to uh, was that taking a beating 
is not necessarily what I view as toughness. Um, something I learned firsthand because I'm someone who can take a beating. Uh, I can endure a lot of physical punishment and I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I, in fact, I hate it. But once it's happening, I'm like, well, I probably can't stop this from happening. But it's a virtue, I think, if I can continue to get beat up uh, and don't die or give up, um, people will think that I'm cool and that it's cool that I did that. Um, so that's kind of where it all started for me, like my first wrestling <laughs> practice where I just got the shit kicked out of me and uh, everyone was trying to pin me because I was a fish and I was the new kid. Uh, but I was like, I'm going to let my rib pop out and not get pinned. And that's good. Um, <laughs> that's kind of where, where it all comes from. So my, my origins of the definition of toughness, like my first exposure was, was, you know, smile through the pain, you know, endure pain. And, and that is, that is being tough is you know, hurting a lot and being okay with it. Uh, so I, I'd like just to go around and to talk about, uh, you know, how, how do you view toughness? Maybe how did you first view it versus how you view it now? Uh, to start your general impressions about the word, uh, however you want to take this for, for the beginnings. Go. <laughs> well, uh, well, first of all, I think it would be a good idea to kind of like settle on the definition of toughness we're operating with here, because toughness is kind of a, a bit of a buzzword in uh, combat sports and in, in MMA and combat sports in general, where everyone just kind of throws it around willy nilly, like. I mean, uh, you should, I think we should differentiate between like physical durability, the attribute of physical durability and uh, toughness as, a, as kind of like you, know, like you described, the virtue. So uh, I, I, my personal definition is like, I would define toughness. It may not necessarily be true. It's just my own take on this is that it's the ability to withstand uh, physical and mental uh, pain and suffering and uh, push through it and achieve your goals nonetheless despite all that stuff that's currently way bearing you down so i guess we could work with that definition what do you think what do you think um i would say yeah i think like generally i view it as not necessarily just pushing through adversity and overcoming it but just uh um, not being discouraged because even if you don't accomplish your goal as long as you I think you maintain your persistence and you don't become discouraged in the face of adversity um, that's probably uh, my preferred definition of toughness I agree there's a uh, there's like a, a a split we have to define between durability and toughness because although I think they're linked they're not the same like um, just because you can take physical punishment, uh, I, that is a part of toughness. But like someone who can't, like um, if you get if you just like lose your chin and you get hit and you go limp every time or you get knocked out cold, I have a, I have trouble saying that that person's not tough just because their lights go off when they get hit. Right? Like toughness is more like a stubbornness. Like a, I don't know. And, and I th it, so it's, it's linked to durability, like, like the physical stuff you have to go through cannot be separated from the mental. You mentally experience the physical trauma. So that's a huge part of it. But that one situation where your lights sh shut off, I have trouble just because you go out the, I, that I would say that you're not durable, but that doesn't mean you're not tough. Um, and, and the other, the other uh, point I think I would make is that I think it's not like we would say like this person's tough or this person's tough. I think it's not like a characteristic that a person possesses all the time. It's a quality that you demonstrate in moments and that you don't in other moments. No one is tough through every situation all the time, no matter what. You're tough at sometimes and at other times you're not tough. And I don't know. So it's more like a quality you demonstrate in moments, not like a, a solid characteristic through that you demonstrate all the time through your whole life. That's what I got. Yeah, uh, I guess that's the danger, really, with, uh, with trying to really like chip everything away and nail something, nail an, an abstract concept to a, a really strict definition. So I think I think uh, uh, I'm pretty sure Hex will say lots of has lots of thoughts on that particular topic. So go ahead. 
Uh, I would I would mostly reinforce what Zach said with respect to definitions, but I'd also add a qualifier. I think just the phrase toughness or durability is pretty much useless without an extra term in front of it. So I think if you really want to get something out of using a term like toughness, you should say, let's say uh, mental toughness, physical toughness, toughness to the body. Because I think one of, one of the classic examples for me of somebody who's in, like, I don't think anyone would deny was tough, but maybe wasn't so physically durable is Tommy Hearns. Nobody can deny that Hearns wasn't an unbelievably tough person, but due to a combination of his um, physical gifts, his fighting style, and he cut a lot of weight at times, I think many people would say that, you know, Thomas Hearns' durability was at a lower level than his toughness. So when you're kind of dealing with complex examples of like that, somebody that does have a lot of heart and a lot of belief in himself and ability to fight some absolute wars, but is also a little bit fragile in certain contexts, the only way you can kind of analyze a fighter like that in a balanced way is to start thinking about more than just toughness. You think about toughness to the body. You think about toughness in wars. You think about toughness in the last three five rounds of a boxing match or the last two rounds of a five-round mixed martial arts match. So I think the short version is, yeah, mostly reinforcing what Zach said and adding the qualifier that I think the more specific you are when you talk about somebody's toughness and the more real life examples you connect that idea of toughness to, the better your analysis will be. Yeah, uh, I, I have a, uh, an example that I go to a lot these days uh, of something that kind of helps me explain where I draw the line and what's tough and what isn't um, with regard to physical versus mental versus other things. Um, and, and with regard to MMA, you, you brought up Tommy Hearns. I think, you know, bringing up specific athletes at this point is going to be very helpful for us to, to nail down some of these concepts with examples. Uh, so someone that I talk about a lot is Uriah Faber. Um, and Uriah Faber is someone who's extremely physically talented, uh, you know, great attributes, uh, good weapons, you know, veteran of the game by all accounts seems like someone who is fearless, but I have seen a couple fights where I get a different sort of impression from him. And like Zach said, toughness isn't there all the time at the same level. Like it, it you know, the human psyche is so complex and uh, in flux and you're not going to be the same guy every day. Um, and, and things happen to, to change your mind, to make things different. So I'm not saying that this is your eye of favor all the time, but one fight that sticks out to me is, that's a good, a good point. Uh, one with, I, so there's stuff coming up in the chat. I'm going to be reacting to it. I can't stop myself. Uh, one fight that sticks out to me is the Jose Aldo fight, right? Where he got beat up really bad. Um, he got beat up really bad, but he never, he never gave up being in the fight. And I say it that way. I say being in the fight uh, because I do believe that he gave up trying to win the fight. And that doesn't mean that he just let Aldo beat him up. But he was content, I believe, to let the fight go to decision uh, and to take the beating he was, was getting and let it st stick with that. And you might ask me, what was he supposed to do? Take risks, basically. And it's interesting because Faber is a fi fighter who has taken risks in a lot of other contexts, you know, trying things that, that were risky but could have yielded great results. Uh, notably, he was knocked out twice, at least, doing these things. Uh, against Tyson Griffin before he was in the WC, he got knocked out doing a uh, like a Superman punch or something of that nature. And against Mike Brown, he tried to bounce off the cage and elbow him and, uh, and caught a hook and got put down. So I think he might have some sort of trauma uh, related to risk taking, and that might have affected him in some way. But in that Aldo fight, he got shut out of the fight. His his win condition, the way that he wanted to approach his offense, got shut down very early in that first round. And the damage started to pile up and he felt the speed difference and he felt everything. And it must have been so jarring and it must have been so shocking uh, to have that happen to him where he maybe wasn't even a conscious decision where he just stopped trying. He, he took the back foot. He wasn't really doing anything that was going to do damage. Uh, he didn't really try anything. And yeah, I'm sure he was compromised in a lot of ways. I'm, I'm adding a lot of qualifiers here because I don't, I'm not saying that your eye favorite isn't tough. But there are examples that I'm going to bring up later where I think it's a much better example of mental toughness in a sports context, whereas Faber is someone who's super durable and could take that beating. And you have to be a certain level of tough to just be willing to continue to take the beating uh, for the duration of, of that period, because you, you know how bad it, it, it sucks. 
Um, but at the same time, what other qualities are at play here? Uh, so we talked about, you know, the courage to take risks, like bravery is a concept that I think factors in here. Uh, something else that factors in here, in my opinion, is ego. How much of it is I'm doing this because I just don't want to quit because I, I feel like I can win this somehow. And how much of it is I don't want to get finished because that would make me look bad and feel bad. And I'm protecting my, my ego or my reputation or something like that. And you can never know for certain. Uh, but that's something where I think there's a lot of examples in MMA where people have gotten beat up over long periods of time. And those are the fights where people point to and say, that guy is so tough because uh, he got beat up real bad, but he didn't stop. He didn't quit. You know, he didn't tap. He didn't give up. Um, but at the same time, how many fights can you think of where someone was down early and took a chance and took a risk to try to get back into the fight and they got finished for it? Are they less tough than the guy that was around further to get beat up? And that's kind of where I, I want people's thoughts to go. Uh, what do you think, Hacks? Well, I think one thing that kind of comes to mind to me there is also toughness, as Zach has kind of implied, can be a quality that moves up and down or wavers and strengthens across an athlete's career. And we do need to think about the broader context of not just within a specific fight, but within a fighter's, you know, general, shall we say, rise or decline. One of the most interesting examples for me is GSP. I don't think there's a person on earth that would ever say GSP isn't not just tremendously tough, but also tremendously durable. The fact that he came out of his corner round five fighting for his title and did enough to, depending on who you ask, steal, draw or win the fight against a fighter as dangerous as Johnny Hendricks is insane. And the, I think in some ways, the fact that so many people felt he did steal that fight actually makes it more impressive because he was smart enough to see the only way he could win. Yet this is also the same GSP that tapped the strikes against Matt Serra. And I, I think a very, very large component of whether you think tapping the strikes affects your opinion of GSP as tough and durable or not is what's running through his mind at the time. If GSP honest to goodness felt I've lost this fight, I can't win. There's no way back. And he says, I've, I'm going to admit I've lost. I'm going to tap the strikes. That's a very different, um, I would say, reflection with very different implications for GSP's, let's just put it in air quotes, toughness. Then, you know, if GSP was kind of just dazed and you know muttered something in a in a in a um in almost fear or in surprise or in losing control of the situation because it takes a lot of toughness to recognize not only can't I win this fight but there's no way back for me in this fight so I'm going to call it now and preserve as much of my self as I can people are so locked in on the notion of toughness as this guy didn't get finished or this guy didn't give up when sometimes admitting you've lost can be the toughest and most rational choice of all I mean that's the thing though we, uh, that's the difference uh, that's the you said rational and uh, like this is a really like very emotionally charged thing to admit that you've lost so not many so the ability to remain rational uh, in, in such situation is really a kind of speaks to the um, to the level of uh, well not level or to, to the your well wherewithal to kind of uh, assess the situation correctly and uh, kind of push through your own emotions and your ter inner turmoil and kind of well, basically admit to having lost the contest. So basically, I I'm, I'm literally saying the same thing, <laughs> just using different <laughs> words. <laughs> I, I think George is a really interesting example. I thought about him uh, because I think he's a fighter that uh, a lot of people, at least like the complaints during his reign was that he wasn't a fighter. He wasn't even tough enough to be considered a fighter. He was just an athlete who could out athlete these guys. Like he took the easy way out by wrestling, the safe way out by wrestling and controlling people on the ground and not, uh, not, not taking a more risk when he didn't have to. So like, it's weird because I think people relate toughness to like, like a lack of intelligence almost like, um, 
I mean, if, if you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. Oh, yeah, I think, I think that's why you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, if you have other options, like, there's no reason to brawl when you, like, that's not the point of fighting. You don't have to display toughness all the time. And I think George is tough. Like, the Johnny Hendricks example shows that even in a tough fight where a lot of people had him down, and I personally had that one a draw, by the way, Hacks, uh, I think that fifth round did pull out a draw uh, like he wasn't discouraged by the way the fight was going. He just kept doing his game plan, putting his, putting the, the combos that he trained on him, looks for his takedowns, uh, kept trying to push the pace and keep, and keep going. Like he just didn't stop trying to do what he was supposed to do throughout the fight. But when he did tap the strikes against Sarah, that's, that's, that's tough because, um, c- certainly, giving it is giving up in a sense and that is hard to claim as tough but you know um i think it was probably the right decision given given the position he was in and given how the rest of his career went so it's hard to critique him for that i don't know but i think there's like there's a weird uh there's a weird interplay with also like like intelligence and having more options like the faber aldo example like when Faber's leg was so compromised, like I think he would have taken more risks to try to win that fight and not just survive. I think he was just trying to survive, but basically because he didn't have any more ideas of what to do. If he had ideas, like in the in the second Brown fight where he broke both hands and was throwing elbows, like that's super tough. So like, uh, like whether you are take risks to keep trying and persist versus just take your beating and survive might not be like a, le- like a toughness meter. It might just be like, I'm out of ideas of what to do, which is more like a, your skill set in general or your intelligence in the moment or, or whatever. So I don't, I, there's, there's so many like little variables that, that come into play here. Yeah. Coming back to Ed's point about um, being able to take beatings kind of being uh, related to ego and uh, GSP is an example of a fighter uh, who is uh, who is an, an extremely self-aware fighter. Like he's co- constantly, in every interview he's uh, he's given, uh, he constantly talked about his how he's basically scared shitless before every fight, and it, it, it's not something that uh, I think many fighters would admit to. Like people, they would say, "Oh yeah, I was nervous. This this I, I felt tense," but they wouldn't say, "Oh, I was I was fucking scared shitless. I didn't want to do it." And uh, Frank Mir is another example of a fighter who says that openly. And so it's kind of, um, it's talked about how some people maybe may feel anxious about how they're perceived. And so they could, sometimes they basically take a beating as an out of a different, of a, out of a difficult fight or a difficult situation. So, uh, where was I going with this? <laughs> <laughs> give me give me a sec, give me a sec. Uh uh I can take a point while you're thinking. Fuck, fuck. Yeah, yeah, I can come back point. to you. <laughs> yeah, I think something that we're talking about here, and it's it's uh something that I said in my last answer when I brought up bravery, something you just said, something Zach said when he's we he talked about uh overcoming something. Uh, it, I, I think oh, fuck, wait. is is definitely oh, something to talk about here. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I, I, I can. Uh, you got it. <laughs> GSP is an example of a fighter who is um, he uses his self awareness and uh, to kind of uh, fuck sake <laughs> to, to, to disregard how he's perceived as a fighter, as opposed to some other fighters who take beatings in order to be perceived as tough. And so he doesn't really care about people's opinions of how he's, he's perceived for, and he was, <laughs> he was uh, uh, like Dana White hated him and the UFC brass hated him and they hated dealing with him because he wasn't really an example of a fighter who's you know, an example of a tough guy in their eyes. Like, oh, a fighter should be like this hard nosed brawler who doesn't care about uh, giving and taking. He, he, could, he can take a shot and then give, uh, give it back. 10, 10 times harder and GSP wasn't that GSP was kind of like more concerned with actually winning fights in an, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in an intelligent way <laughs> and uh, so he the com- the most common criticism of GSP is that he oh he's boring 
his uh he didn't really have any wars he didn't really have any fights where he like just decided to slug it out and uh, that's really not who he is as a person and in a sense remaining staying true to yourself when uh, surrounded by people who are telling you you should be that you should be oh you should have done this you should have done that you should have been uh you should have acted differently you should act uh, in general differently and uh, present yourself in a different manner and he didn't do that he didn't really care for all that he just cared about being the best fighter he could be the best athlete uh, athlete he could be and that's that that i think takes guts and that is to your point about bravery it's funny because like um most a lot of the fans that i used to watch fights with always thought similar things about george he's boring not tough not a fighter whereas like almost all the not almost all but a majority of the fighters that i know george was their favorite fighter more fighters have told me george is their favorite fighter than any of them that have dropped any other name by a lot so i think the fact that he fights clean and in dominant fashion is is what fighters want you don't always want to be in wars you want to have dominant clean fights and george was like the ultimate example of that now does that mean all the fighters who want to fight like him aren't tough of course not it's insane i think um John Jones, a controversial figure for many reasons and a controversial figure among the fight site staff because uh, we feel his reputation technically is is highly overrated and his position in the, in the all-time great rankings is highly overrated based on a number of things. But uh, to give credit, uh, John Jones is someone who amassed a huge following uh, during his rise and his title reign. And I think it's maybe dropped off a bit just because of everything else, but John Jones is someone that uh, everyone latched on to because he was winning in such dominant, clean fashion so many times against people that they were seeing as like, this guy's a former champion. This guy was in such high regard and he's putting him away. Uh, and it's no coincidence that John Jones is so freaking tough. Uh, any, any way, any way you want to split it in the fights when he's in competition, uh, he is extremely tough. Not only is he extremely physically durable, which I'm sure helps and perhaps the knowledge of his physical durability, his self-awareness uh, contributes to, to the way he, he behaves uh, in the cage. Um, but I never saw that guy back off ever. Uh, like no matter what was happening to him in, in, in the cage, he was so committed uh, to continuing to try, continuing to try to win a fight. Even when someone gave him a really rough, rough look early on, like there have been fights where it was pretty clear immediately that he was going to be in for a tough one. Uh, the Daniel Cormier fights, uh, Gustafson the, the first time, even the second time Gustafson was actually giving him a tough time uh, for a while. And, uh, you know, Dominic Reyes, uh, even, even Tiago Santos, like he's been in a bunch of tough fights and maybe they were more tough than they needed to be because of his preparation. And you can definitely say that not preparing properly and not taking your career seriously, not being a professional speaks to a lack of toughness in other respects. I think discipline requires a ton of toughness. Uh, to be able to to be willing to put yourself through what you need to to be the best that you can be that's mental strength that most people don't have um, i mean uh, john jones is also kind of a sociopath yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. his brain is not normal yeah, not he just a normal thrives brain. in these weird like <laughs> yeah extremely dangerous uh, stressful situations so but in, in real life <laughs> in just in everyday life not real life he's a mess <laughs> yeah like, i won't pretend he's... to understand him but <laughs> in the fights he is clearly just by, by all definitions are putting out in in the in this vacuum of mma uh it's crazy tough yeah, um and you can point to specific things like uh, everyone likes to say like the the vitor armbar he didn't tap to the vitor armbar and then he's like well if you watch mm. vitor's fights then you would know that once he does what he's going to do he'll basically lie down for you in a very literal sense. He'll lie down for you. Uh, whereas other fighters like Daniel Cormier, he's going to scratch and claw and get every ounce of offense that he can get and you're in for it the entire time. And that's something that's much more demonstrable. And those are the fights that I look at where either the guy is uh, the guy that you're fighting is doing that to you, or you were doing that to them where every second is a battle. You don't stop trying. You don't stop trying to force things, even if it's not working out. And I think, you know, Zach, you talked about ideas. 
um, being representative of, of maybe, you know, how these fights can go one way and, and start to look one way to a person like, oh, he gave up. Um, one recent example could be like Jeff Neal versus Wonderboy. Uh, Jeff Neal ran out of ideas versus Wonderboy. Uh, he didn't have the right ideas in the first place, uh, really. And once he was clearly losing the fight, he just kept trying the same things over and over again. But he kept trying them. Um, he also had the physical durability to, to allow him to do that. And he had the conditioning to allow him to do that, um, which we can talk about if that's toughness or not. But that's someone who may, might not have had a breadth of ideas to help him win the fight. But he, he said, I'm going to keep trying anyway. Uh, just to just to do the same thing to him, and it's it's all I it's all I have. So I got yeah, to make go it work. to go back <laughs> briefly to your Vita Belfort armbar example. Not to go all armchair psychologist on this, but do I, I do believe like uh, uh, like given who John Jones is as a person and what kind of fighter he is, he would he probably realized in his weird assassin reptile brain that this is what <laughs> Vita Belfort is going to do. Like if he doesn't tap now, Vita is just going to give up. And uh, and it's also a bit of an ego thing with him because he clearly he clearly likes being perceived as this genius all terrain fighter who can do anything. So naturally, giving in in this situation would have just uh, just goes against the, everything that he that ev- against all his weird, strange uh, alien <laughs> principles. <laughs> I mean. I, I guess he styles himself after some kind of uh, some kind of uh, image of a warrior king, I guess, who just exists on another plane of existence, another plane of brain thinking. So he's it's kind of like that uh, onion meme, like a uh, guy who would have been uh, a powerful, revered warrior five thousand years ago sells you the best love seat <laughs> they got in their stall. <laughs> uh. Yeah, yeah, Hex is using the raised hand emoji. If if you Hex, if you had a, a webcam, you could have just done this, or maybe a VTuber rig. That that also works. <laughs> I think John Jones is a particularly interesting example um, because there are some very important qualifiers to talking about his toughness for two reasons. Uh, you know, the first reason. I think is we've never seen John Jones lose. And I think a huge indicator of like how tough somebody is, is how do they handle coming back from a major? I love how much disdain you put into into the word every time you say like tough. (laughs) (laughs) You're about to puke just saying it. Because there was a really interesting point that was uh, raised by a guy who I don't know if he posts anymore. It's called Static Eruption on Reddit Boxing. Of all places to get a good insight, right? <laughs> he, uh, he made a point about Canelo and he said, you know, Canelo is incredibly tough, incredibly intelligent, incredibly durable. He's a true pound for pound, impressively great boxer of this generation. The one interesting thing, though, is that Canelo has gone through his entire career knowing that if he gets to the cards he's probably going to win like hundred percent, you know, Canelo is not losing on the cards. He, he drew a card with the fucking Mayweather fight. John Jones has had the cards go his way in almost every single situation in his career. He's always won on the cards, even when a significant population of the mixed martial arts community, former judges, fighters have thought, no, he should have lost that. I'm fascinated thinking about the idea of toughness with respect to John Jones. Cause from what we've seen, he's incredibly tough. But given he knows he's up on the cards almost every time, given he knows he's the UFC golden boy and can get away with almost anything, given that he knows he's probably on a level of roids that almost every other fighter in the competition can only dream of and USADA will cover him, just how tough does John Jones need to be? Uh scratching my my beard because i i don't know <laughs> i have to ponder <laughs> zach did you have a point that you wanted to make before that a uh, very very complex question was posed monkey think <laughs> monkey think no i don't know that's that's a good that's a interesting way to think about it like he has all these other things behind him so uh, even when you think he's tough it's probably a little bit lessened 
if if you believe believe all the things Hacks was just going through. Yeah. I don't know. That's uh that's <laughs> interesting. I guess where I would like to give him credit again is just because even though even though like the Reyes fight, for example, I wonder if he knew he was losing. Oh, you know he probably I mean? knew. He definitely he probably knew. knew. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he, he feels himself getting hit the way he gets hit. But I he... mean, look at what he said <laughs> after he like uh, after the Tiago Santos fight. Oh, the, the the guy is so tough. The guy is so strong. He's a he's a he's, he's a, a Muay Thai black belt. Muay Thai <laughs> black belt. Just uh, instantly, just thinking up uh, all these. Um, I guess excuses. <laughs> I mean, what what else are they? I mean, is is trying to put asterisks uh, asterisks on every situation where he doesn't right. really necessarily look uh, the best, and he uh, clearly c- cares about uh, being perceived as uh, this once again like the greatest. So. Mm-hmm. Where I was going with that, if we were talking about like stubbornness uh, as an indication of how tough someone is, uh, just in that fight. He pressured harder than I think I've seen him pressure in probably any other fight. And I don't know if it's because Reyes really actively took the back foot and he's like, okay, I'll pressure you. Or if that was the game plan, but he didn't stop. Uh, He pressured super hard. It was a very impressive cardio performance. It was very impressive. You are getting hit doing this a lot and it is clearly not working that well, but he didn't stop trying. And that always uh, speaks to me. But again, it's like, is that him being a chin bully? Like, do strikes affect him the same way as other people? I didn't know. I can't know I mean, what he was feeling. Does in fighting situation. really affect John Jones the same way know. it does other people? He's <laughs> so hard to, to pin down. That's the thing. He's, he's so unique. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, he's like, it, it's kind of like, uh, like uh, the alien movies. Uh, I know it's a monster, but I admire its purity. Yeah, should I stop thinking about him as a person? Should I stop trying to put him in, in a box? The humanize, of other people? The, the humanize him. Zach, I want to talk about Jordan Burroughs. Do you want to talk about Jordan Burroughs? I mean, sure. I, I mean, that's that's what happens when we, we got hacks on, on uh, get hacks on the podcast. He just says something, and everyone is like, <laughs> and they don't Jordan. understand anything. <laughs> the monkeys. Uh, <laughs> I think Jordan Burrow is one of the toughest dudes alive. Uh, just the sheer amount of times that I've seen him in like what seems like an impossible situation in a match, uh, and he comes back and pulls something out of his ass and wins, or it comes damn near close to winning. It's just you can't even. It's every. It's happened too many times. It's just undeniable that he has something uh, different uh, about him mentally that allows him to do the things he does, and you know. Uh, Hacks will probably talk about it because now that I'm bringing up American wrestling, but uh, American wrestlers typically have a short prime. They have, they have short lifespans because the, the, the training methodology, uh, the way the system works is people get their bodies broken down a lot faster than they would in like a Soviet system where there's a lot less intensive uh, physical training and, and they're, they're by design I mean, you know, the, have more longevity. Uh, <laughs> the, the principles and the, uh, the priorities are just different. Right. Right. Yeah, and the virtues, what is considered a virtue in American wrestling and in Soviet wrestling or Russian wrestling, they are very different. And we get into it about how a lot of the culture was shaped by, uh, you know, the Gable era and and how Gable himself, uh, a lot of the culture today is modeled after him, and he was the quintessential overtrainer. Um, that was his entire thing. He was working harder than everyone else, and it, and it doesn't matter if it was breaking his body because he was strong enough physically and mentally that. He could, he could get through that and he could be like half broken, but he believed so hard in his training that he could do anything in a match and, and you could never, you could never overcome him. And that's definitely um, something that that's deeply ingrained into the culture now in, in the United States. But uh, someone like Jordan Burroughs, people would consider of a different mold just because when he first broke out internationally in 2011 and 2012, it was like, he is the double leg guy. He is such a great athlete. Look at him go. Look at him double like these people. But 10 years later, he's a completely different athlete. Uh, you, I, I see him in, in such a different light. I think everyone sees him in such a different light. That he's somebody that even when his athleticism shifted, I don't want to say faded, but his, his physical properties changed. Uh, he kept up with it. He never stopped uh, finding ways to win. And you know, in the matches, in his career, like he's, he's the guy. Um, just... In, in every way, in every way, he's the guy. And, you know, the most recent example, 
would be his uh his super his super match with David Taylor. Uh, David Taylor had 25 pounds on him, and it was the world champion <laughs> at that weight two years ago. And uh, it, it became very clear very quickly that Burroughs had no avenue to get to his game at all. First of all, David Taylor just in a three point stance, his arms covered the entire window uh, that Jordan Burroughs could shoot on, and that was his whole game. And he couldn't move him around hand fighting because he had 25 pounds on him. So there was no way for him to win. And instead of trying to, you know, say, okay, whatever, uh, or playing defense or, or whatever, he just shot into his arms and just <laughs> bulldozed through until he could get something on a leg and just just pure force of will got these push outs and, and got it to criteria and was on the legs with like a few seconds left and almost beat him. Uh, he almost beat him. And it was like the craziest thing I've ever seen, uh, which made it really sad a couple a month later when he couldn't do anything to Kyle Dake. And it just kind of speaks to that Kyle Dake is an insane freak genius. Uh, but Jordan Burroughs, yeah, man, like, like he's, he's the guy. <laughs> four, pu- four push-outs in a row down 4-0, right? Yeah. And then lost yeah. one criteria. But he is absolutely a guy who's just like, like not able to be discouraged. Like mm-hmm. he is going to just persist and keep going and – and I think this relates how much, how much your toughness relates to your belief. You know, I was going to talk about this when we were talking about if this could be, if it could be taught or not. Let's just do it. <laughs> because, uh, because, uh, you know, like you can't train, you can't train like physical durability. You can only train mental, maybe a little bit, but like, it's I like, mean, it's kind you, of you, like punching power, isn't it? Like, uh, uh yeah, hitters are so. born. But you can still kind of, uh, with the proper training, you can still teach a person how to punch correctly and they bec- they'll become a decent hitter anyway. Yeah. You can, see, you can teach someone to punch harder, but you can't teach someone to punch hard. Yeah. You can, you can teach someone to be maybe a little more comfortable in uncomfortable situations, which I think maybe is, is a bit of what, of what toughness can be in those, in those tough spots. But I think it relates a lot to like, your beliefs and your ability and what what you what you can do like i'm I mean, that's... not going to be discouraged i'm going to follow what i'm i believe in like my game plan my training i'm going to like just persist i have multiple hopefully you have multiple options so it doesn't yeah. uh, like fall back on one thing where you keep getting beat at that one that one like a type of engagement or whatever but i mean i think you can teach composure you can teach a person to be comfortable under fire with enough uh, practice. Like, uh, like with the examples of GSP and John Jones, I think the, while they're very different as people, they still possess this, uh, like in a, uh, this mental discipline to kind of uh, just, well, like you said, uh, able to uh, prevent themselves from being discouraged. Like, so then you can kind of, uh, I'm for, I'm once again forming definitions in my brain. I just I, can, I can't help it. <laughs> I guess it's, it's 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 a linguistics thing. So I think my current definition, having listened to to all of you speak and having discussed this toughness in combat sports, is kind of to me seems like the result of the interplay between the physical attribute of durability, composure under stress, and personal dif- uh, discipline, wherein the fighter is able to remain cool under fire and trust in the process they've been taught by their coaches and uh, endure physical and mental stresses in order to push through those obstacles and employ their own skill set and leverage their physical attributes effectively in order to win the fight. So I think that's pretty comprehensive. Yeah, that was good. Excellent. I loved it. I bury that definition. <laughs> yeah, I think um, Hackstar actually has a, another example he'd like to put forward. I think what I like about that definition is it it captures there's a lot of Tuman's favorite word nuance in the idea of toughness, because one of one of the most interesting examples for me for what I would call and this is mostly purely mental toughness, physical toughness to a lesser degree because it's about playing internet video games, but there's a there's an Australian Dota player called Anna and he played in a team well he still plays in a team called OG. And he plays uh, mid, which for those who know nothing about Dota is kind of a space creation map dominating role. Like you set the pace of the game. (laughs) And Anna was kind of known for struggling mentally 
on this role, even though he had some of the biggest tournament wins in the world, when it came to the biggest in Dota, which is called the international, he really struggled. He struggled mentally. He lost his composure. He took a year off after really kind of imploding in, 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 I think it was the 2017 international. And he came back and he changed roles. He went from mid to carry, which is like the superstar of the show. You get fed all the resources on the map. You, you beat everybody up. It's the monkey role, in a sense. You're like a hyper-intelligent, calculating monkey. <laughs> Tim and lost that way. Sorry. And he came back. So his role had changed in the team. He had a different set of responsibilities. If his team was to win a game, he had to do a different bunch of things. He came back as the best fucking player on the planet. Probably the best player to ever play Dota. He clutched every situation. He stomped every team. He just looked like the world's biggest Chad. And this was from like a 17 year old at the time. He was doing stuff that like was under an insane amount of pressure and in, in situations where almost every player on the planet, all of the like analytics were saying, there's no way he could win this. There was like analytics based off machines playing perfect games. And they were saying, there's no way he can win this. And he kept winning and his team won the international twice in a row. And I've always wondered with respect to this mental toughness change we saw in this young player, Anna, why? Why did it happen? Did it happen as a result of a change in his role in the game? Did it happen as a result of the change in the other players in his team? The team dynamic changed a bit. Did it happen because he was like 16 at the time and he grew up a little bit? Was it a combination of all these different factors? Or as he himself said, was it also the experience of losing? Did losing really badly on a stage in front of hundreds of thousands if not millions of viewers being totally humiliated bring out something in him and for me it's a really interesting example of toughness because we had somebody where their greatest weakness was toughness and it was exposed in such a public and dynamic way and then it became probably his greatest attribute and in doing so has probably made him one of the greatest if not the greatest dota player ever if we talk about toughness and I kind of relate that back to something like MMA. And I, I don't want to, my previous discussion on Jones, I don't want to come across as like I'm saying Jones isn't tough. It's more, I want to contrast somebody like Jones or Canelo who have always had all of the advantages on their side, who've never been humiliated. They're incredibly tough. But if I compare them to somebody like Anna in terms of toughness, because Anna lost, because he had to come back, because we saw how he responded to no longer being the favorite son, we see a, an idea or a conceptualization of greatness that I think is just so much more meaningful. So I'm not subtracting things from a Jones or a Canelo. They're extraordinary. They belong on the pound for pound lists. It's more in Anna's toughness. We see something that moves him from a top 10 pound for pound Dota guy to maybe the greatest player to ever do it. And so when I, you know, I really want to relate that back to toughness because I think so much thinking about toughness is negative and reductionist it's you didn't do x so you're lesser i think we need to flip the equation this guy did more so he was greater gsp came off round five and showed he can't you know if you're going to beat him you're going to have to beat him aldo was down the losing the same way he lost the first fighting as max holloway with no clear path to victory and was still like go fuck yourself you want this you know like do you want to beat the shit out of me or not well you better um, you know, Aljo was losing comprehensively to Yan because as it turns out, he wasn't as strong as Yan in the clinch. Hi, Ben. Um, but he, <laughs> he kept fucking trying. <laughs> that matters. Yes, much respect to Aljamain Sterling. And that's a fight where I think it could get confused with kind of a Uriah Faber situation where his, uh, his attempts could be seen as futile. Uh, what they certainly, Peter Young made them seem like they were futile, but uh, just to even stick to that plan, which was a, a suicide mission by all accounts, uh, that, that says a lot. Um, maybe a, a quick topic change in, in some sense, but Zach Makovsky, I kind of have a question for you in relation to some of the stuff that's come up uh, here, because you're the one who is a professional fighter and has been around a lot of professional fighters. Uh, with regard to the Jones question, uh, when we're talking about Jones and I was talking about the in the cage versus out of the cage uh, where, you know, discipline and training hard is definitely a factor of toughness. Uh, what have you observed with regard to the relationship between how tough someone's lifestyle and you know, how tough are they in committing to the lifestyle that they need to uh, in preparation for a fight versus 
what happens in the cage and, and what kind of mentality they show in the cage. Do you think there's anything that's like one to one? Do you have you seen a lot of variants? Just like what what have you observed there? Um, I mean, I think generally, I don't think it's the case always, but generally, I think the people that are consistent and disciplined uh, carry that extra belief with them into into fights. Um, you know what? Like this is this was a while ago, but the people I knew at Jackson's when this is when Jones was like in the middle of his main, uh, his early title run, um, they would like, he actually wasn't training super, super hard or super consistently, but he put in like a lot of like, they said he would like study the study his opponents. Like when he was going to fight Shogun, like relentlessly watch and study and like, uh, just visualize and was like confident he could go out and do it without actually training super hard you know i mean i think uh, like I, I train with ryan hall sometimes and i don't see him like a lot of times put in like grueling effort in the gym but he's very smart he knows exactly how he wants to approach every situation and uh i don't know i mean i, I don't it, it's really hard to like those aren't I would say Jones and Ryan, this is not a, like a insult or anything, but those are guys that if, when I think about toughness, they generally don't come to my mind, but I think that's because we have misdefined toughness in general, which is why I'm happy we're doing this. So follow-up question. Uh, I won't make you toot your own horn, but I'm going to do it for you. You're super tough. You're crazy tough. Um, in particular, not just because of like you've been in fights that are difficult, but your style is inherently difficult. And every time I watch you fight, I'm like, this is so hard. You were doing something that is very difficult that a lot of people wouldn't be able to pull off. Um, and a lot of it is, I don't know how intentional it is, but just, you know, the fact that you end up on the back foot a lot, just people like to try to put you on the back foot. I've been talking about it recently. It's become a more and more popular talking point for me is that's probably the hardest thing to do in MMA with regard to striking is, is, you know, control the cage on the outside and, and fight moving backwards both physically it's difficult you get more tired doing that and also mentally you you concede something uh someone has kind of an inherent advantage uh, by being the one moving forward both you know physiologically just the way that striking works but also the judges hate it <laughs> they, they hate counters and they hate uh, moving backwards so you're putting yourself in a more difficult situation that way and the way that you wrestle and the way that you're willing to uh, work through your offense. You know, if you get to a shot and, you know, it's not super clean, you're not going to get a clean finish there. You can break off and strike. And it's just so physically intensive. And it's so, you're so willing to chip away and, and just pick up your points, pick up your points, pick up your points. It really reminds me of those, of those wrestling matches or those fights where someone is just going to, they're willing to put in the work over time and, and very consistently build their offense. And no matter what's happening, just continue building the offense um, and, and just stick to it. It's, it's I think workmanlike is probably a good, a good word for it. Um, but it's also funny because you're a great athlete and you've thrown people over your head a bunch of times and you've done a, really, a lot of really cool, physically impressive things. And that's a very rare combination. Um, so you're somebody where I'm like, wow, how does he do this? And like, how do you stick to it? How do you not get bored? first of all, of doing these very stressful sequences in a fight. So I, I guess talk to me a little bit about how do you approach your training and how do you think that affects the way that you fight? Well, I think it would be hard to be bored in stressful situations, <laughs> like the opposite. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think I'm not someone who people typically view as tough either. Like I don't brawl or even really any engagement. I don't really want to make it an exchange. I'd rather land and land clean and get out mm -hmm. or land and smother or whatever. And I think like even this, that last fight, as I was getting in the cage, uh, Shorty Torres said, Zach shies away from the battle a little bit. Oh. As I, 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 and <laughs> you know what? Like I, I was like, I don't like the way you put that, but I know what you're saying. Like I'm, I don't brawl, but I don't think that's see, like, do you have to, be willing to take shots to be tough or like if you don't have to I, like maybe i'm not displaying toughness when i land land a counter and exit immediately but um 
why would you do that when you don't have to like uh like toughness i think i think sometimes you have to re- you have to fall back on toughness when your technique fails you know so i i, I try to not do that i, I wouldn't want to rely on my toughness unless i think i'm the worst fighter in there if i'm a less skilled fighter that's when i'm gonna have to rely on my toughness more mm-hmm. so I, I don't know yeah i guess um shorty torres <laughs> <laughs> is that a friend of me uh, i think i actually wrote yeah. about it a lot the thing about uh uh fighters relying on their attributes in lieu mm-hmm. of actually relying on their skill set uh, and trusting in the process so it's interesting to hear a fighter actually say that yeah <laughs> yeah and not all fighters are self-aware i think so you're not going to get the insight from i mean everybody, uh, just as hack says I'm glad uh, we have self-awareness <laughs> is a superpower yeah <laughs> but uh just to clarify a point when i talk about getting bored I mean, uh, when you're kind of in the zone of doing the right thing over and over and over again, uh, fighting the urge to break from the patterns and try to do something that would I want to do something cool re- relieve the uh, <laughs> the pressure of having to be disciplined uh, to do something big or try to you know, you know change things a little bit and like push your advantage further because your style is that you have to work very 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 hard to do the things that you want to do. Um, I guess what I was kind of trying to lead you into was saying is that because in the gym all the time you're very used to working very 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 hard so you know you can do it so it's not like when you get into the cage and you're thinking the way I'm going to win this fight is working super hard and I'm scared of that you're not scared of it because you're like I can do that no problem Uh, is it not even a question in your brain no I mean that's part of the stress you have before you go like I try to put myself in the mentality that like okay I'm ready for the toughest 15 minutes of my life. If I have to, if I have to go through that, I'll go through it. Like I, I'm confident in the work I put in and I'm ready to go through the hardest 15 minutes of my life. Um, now I try not to like actively fight that way. I'll, I'll fall back on that if, if my technique's failing or whatever, but you know, I just try to execute the things I've been working on and read the situation in the moment it's, it's hard it's like not like i'm not like thinking ahead too much like oh i'm gonna change things up and do this like maybe between rounds or something but like it's it's so fast and like you don't really have time to like take a big picture that's why like when, we're, when you guys were talking about jones and if he thought he was winning or losing it's it's really tough like mm-hmm. it's like such a blur you really have no idea what it at least i don't really have an idea of what it looks like from the outside perspective if anything, I usually have like a more negative view. Of the, when I watch it, I'm like, oh, I did better than I thought, which is why I was extra confident in this one because I knew I won the first two. But anyway, you did. You did. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> An interesting concept of com- this is what's so interesting about the concept of composure and trust in the process that's been instilled in you in the gym. Like, there, there are, I'm sure you know many examples of people who are really like, like murderous fighters uh, exhibit murderous level of skill in the gym and then when they get to the cage they kind of like just basically uh, like implode like do uh, do you know examples of this? without naming names have you known actually people like like this because it's a, a common talking point but uh i mean how really how prevalent really is it i've seen i've seen it when people get like um whether it's in a fight or in training if like they're used to sparring and fighting and then suddenly they get like knocked out whether it's the fight or it's in sparring they like there's like that doubt is like with them for a long time i've seen people get over it really well and i've seen it haunt people still i think to to for years years and they just can't get over that they shot they like they like I see them in the gym, like actively avoiding sparring rounds, like miss sparring days, make excuses, and then just kind of fight in a different way than they used to. And they may even have a reason for why they think they're doing it, but it's, it's, it's been in certain situations, pretty obvious to me what they're going through. And I don't, I, I, I didn't, I don't think I was close enough to these people to like, uh, like make them look inward I didn't approach it like, Hey, do you know why you're doing this? Like, are you, is this something you're like really worried about? Have you confronted this yourself and think about what the best way to handle it is? I didn't do that in these situations because I wasn't 
I didn't feel like I was close enough to them, but I don't know. I think a lot of the time it's uh, it's really the fact that the trust in their own skill set has been compromised, basically. So as a result, they kind of think about, oh, I need to change something up. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. So they kind of get filled with this self-doubt, which is really hard to overcome. So yeah. And then when, they, when you have that doubt, that like, like I was like, I think like that, like visceral toughness can has to come from some kind of like confidence and belief. And once that doubt creeps in, like you may show a glimpse of it and then shy away. And it, it's really hard to, to like fully get back, I think. Yeah, Which is why right. I try to never take shots in the first place. Because I'm sure I could get knocked out. I just don't want to. Yeah, uh, that's uh, like a lot of people tend to uh, justify uh, certain fighters' behavior outside the cage by saying that in order to be a fighter, you need to be delusional to, to some extent. And uh, I've always questioned that because uh, like, as we've said already, self-awareness is a big plays a big part of you, how well you, should, you you are able to fight and how well you you from how you approach training and all that but uh it looks like he's uh, like he wants to say something he, he's got how thoughts can you in his head <laughs> good student uh <laughs> but just uh, with regard to shake and confidence really changing things and changing toughness and, and performance a really good example that I definitely wanted to bring up was Chad Mendez because Chad Mendez is somebody who you know, had been knocked out before, but definitely was easing himself into rising into a new level of confidence when he got with uh, Dwayne Ludwig uh, with that whole run up to the, to the Aldo rematch, which is one of the toughest fights of all time. I mean, they really, ne they never backed down that there was so much adversity for both of them in that fight. It was physically just, extremely demanding it was mentally extremely demanding technically demanding it was demanding in every sense it was one of like the craziest tests a, a fighter could ever go through for each guy and after that fight who would ever question chad mendez you know mentality you know, his toughness but uh things changed right uh he got knocked out again by by edgar and kind of a flash knockdown i'm sure things might have changed in the gym as well especially with the camp kind of falling apart uh, with the training situation with, with Dwayne leaving. And I believe somewhere in that time period is also when he failed his drug test, um, which, you know, perhaps that changed his training in another way. Uh, it you know, took away some another source of confidence for him. Uh, so you saw in other fights like uh, Volkanovski or, or even McGregor. McGregor is a tougher one because he got, I keep saying tough, tough is such a, uh, has so many meanings that we're seeing, we're using it a lot. And it's in an extremely that we broad, an yeah. extremely broad concept. And extremely but difficult. luckily, our, our listeners understand context. <laughs> you just used it as in difficult. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's a good way, good way to use it. Um, but I think the McGregor fight is a more difficult uh, example because uh, he got worked to the body a lot, and people giving up or you know shying away or you know giving the body language that they don't want to be there anymore the way he did at the end of that second round where he was like backing off a lot and turning I mean, away, Try, probably just trying to get out of the round because he was dead tired from getting his body worked. I mean, getting body, body worked is one of the worst things you can yeah, ever experience. Yeah, that'll break a person's so, toughness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so that fight's a weird example, but the Volkanovski fight's an interesting one because uh, Volkanovski's pressure, I think, affected him mentally. And I just think that there was a change in his confidence with regard to what he felt like he could take and what he was willing to go through. I'm not even sure it was entirely just not trusting his chin or his durability, but just that he didn't want to do it again. Um, after I mean, he went through all that with Aldo, like you can muster up, you can, you can, we say in wrestling, dig deep. Um, I don't know if they say that MMA a lot, but they say it in wrestling all the time, every day, dig deep uh, to, to bring out that, that extra gear or whatever you have left in you or, or push past mentally your physical boundaries. Um, maybe he just didn't want to do it again. And that's why people who have had multiple five round, you know, drag out wars are amazing to me that you've been through that before, you know what it's like, and you're still willing to go through it again um, after whatever trauma that, that induced. And maybe it's yeah, uh, that's, uh, the that's curse just... of, of self-awareness that makes you not want to do it again. Maybe the people that do do it again are kind of uh, 
you know, able to block that out and not even think about it. <laughs> That's what Hex was saying about toughness being kind of situational. And it's, it also really depends on the person. Like, dig deep. How deep can you dig? Like, it's, uh, it's not a... It's it's not a flat kind of like statistic across every person. Not every person has the same amount of ability to dig deep. And plus, like once you dig deep, kind of just how much do you want to experience it again? I mean, it just sucks. <laughs> and getting body work sucks. And to the a brief as a as a brief aside about durability, like and uh, mental toughness and all that all that stuff getting hit to the face is kind of it's it's really different from getting hit to the body so you, you can kind of if you've got a good chin you can take a lot on the chin and then you just kind of be oh okay i can take those and then you get hit to the body and you're like oh fuck this <laughs> i don't want to do this anymore <laughs> it just sucks <laughs> so that's why that's why everyone should body punch everyone to, every analyst talks about this every fighter talks about this but nobody actually body punches just Drives me up the wall, this stuff. Yeah, Hex is using the hand emoji because he doesn't have a webcam. <laughs> I, I think maybe two points. Firstly, that really hits on an element of toughness that a lot of people overlook. Um, toughness to the body. Not all fighters are like Yan, where you can hit their body for a full round with a you know an assault that's wilted basically every other fighter in the bantamweight division. And Yan's response is like, oh, look. Oh, it's vermin. I shall now crush the vermin. Like, he, how many times has, has Yan copped a shellacking to the body in, in part because of his defensive choices and preferences? And Yan is like, I don't care. I can still go five rounds. The um, second thing I would say with respect to Chad Mendes is Chad Mendes is a really good example of a concept that I kind of introduced when I was talking about FIG, um, which, which what I call first and second stage adaptations. Because Fig is terrifying. He might be the best fighter to ever fight in MMA for those first stage adaptations, the first wrinkle you give him, and he decides to send something back at you. But we've never really seen somebody consistently test Fig with the second or the third level. I wonder if some degree Chad Mendes's toughness, not entirely just because of who he is as a person, but because of his camp, because of the training situation, because of the fact that he, you know, he really, really needed the ultra important mental support of that skin cream you know you start taking those things away and <laughs> might have been able to have enough in him to power through and toughness through a really complex nasty brutal fight with aldo but he may not have had it for a second time or a third time i think that's especially true because even the most kind analysis of tam would say that as a gym technically there are a lot of first stage responses too like they can throw one thing back at you. Like Gar Garbrandt looked pretty well coached for the one stage that Cruz was going to throw. And then he fought TJ and TJ's like, oh shit, he knocked me on my ass. I'm going to try something different a second time. And Cody was like, you know, monkey noises and then died <laughs> twice in a row. So yeah, I, I think one thing that really sticks out to me with toughness is people have this assumption that one fight means toughness or one bad situation means toughness. Toughness can be a multi-layered thing. Not everybody has the ability in them to be through, like, how many terrifying wars has Aldo been through now? And he's still like, fuck you. I've got one and a half. Or, you know, it was originally two and a half. Now it's one and a half. Now it might be half a round where I can still fight. My old man knees don't collapse <laughs> and my lungs don't give in. But I'm not afraid of you until that happens. <laughs> uh I mean, uh, fighting while tired is kind of uh, frequently overlooked aspect of toughness. Uh, like Jan is actually uh, is a kind of an example to me. Like resembles he resembles John Jones in a sense in that respect because he kind of like one of those like weird sociopaths <laughs> that just don't react to stressful situations the same way as everyone does. And to the, like his toughness to the body kind of speaks to that. And also to the point about getting bored. Like if you take into account the Al Jayan fight, he looked like he, he was getting bored in that one because he was getting nothing in in, uh, in, in response, and so he was basically started. He basically started to try trying out moves, different moves he likes to do. And <laughs> I think a really good holistic example uh, that I forgot to mention because Hacks put it in the chat when I first started, and I was like, I'm going to get to that, and it's been an hour. Uh, so here I am coming back to it. 
Uh, Frankie Edgar, and I know Zach loves Frankie Edgar, so I'm sure he'll be about this. Uh, but Frankie Edgar is, is all, all the types, all the types of toughness, right? Uh, he, he's physically, well, I don't, even, I don't even know if you could say he's physically durable. Perhaps his toughness is demonstrated because he's not entirely physically durable in some senses, or he's just been hit really hard uh, a few times and, and he's gotten rocked because he has a normal person's chin. Um, but his recovery time is insane. And I, I've heard, I can't confirm this scientifically, I've heard recovery time is linked to your conditioning. Um, you know, being in really good shape helps you snap back into it it's faster. It's kind rocked. of one of those old wives' tales that permeate fighting constantly. Who knows if it's true or not, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I believe his secret technique of, of doing a, a backward somersault when he gets rocks to get back to his base, he's able to reorient himself uh, faster. <laughs> uh, I think that actually uh, helps him get, get his senses about, about him again, but uh, it's just so hard to put my finger on it, and I think this is the trouble that analysis this has in general and analysts have in general is so much of conceptual conversations like this relies on a lot of assumptions of our fighters thinking about things at all during the fights because i know i personally have extreme performance anxiety so when i compete i black out and i don't know anything that's going on it's it's a hundred percent autopilot i am it's like literally like what a happened? blackout yeah and then it's over and i'm like did that what did i do um, like I, I kind of felt it happening, but my brain wasn't on. Um, and if I didn't train hard enough, then it didn't go well because I, my automatic responses weren't where they needed to be. I, I mean, wasn't there making decisions. Um, so that, that makes me wonder, like in a Frankie Edgar fight where he gets rocked really badly in the first round by Gray Maynard both times, uh, or like Benson Henderson in the second round with the upkick or, or things like that, all the times he's been rocked early in fights and has come back to put on really like I said before, workman like you know, smart, you know, in inspirational performances uh, where he you know put on a lot of volume and, and got to to a game and, and put it on him and uh, made the other person go like, what are you made of? What is this? How are you doing this to me? I thought I killed you. Um, like, is that him saying like, come on, Frankie, let's get let's get back in it, or is he just in a daze and his automatic brain is go do the things I know how to do? And did get him getting rock put him into autopilot? Was he going to be an autopilot either way? Like it's things that I cannot say for certain without talking to him. Um, and Zach has never been knocked down or out rather. So I can't ask Zach because he's too perfect. Uh, but eventually I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Uh, I'm sure it varies from case to case, but I, I got knocked wonder. down and knocked out a couple of times, a bunch of times. In times, did you, <laughs> so... did you come back like a zombie and, and kick their ass for five rounds after? <laughs> well no it, it wasn't rounds that's it what i want to know it's it was uh the uh, just the common realities of living in rural siberia so <laughs> yes yes <laughs> so i mean it's you it kind of uh, with, with, with me personally i wasn't really thinking about anything it, mm. just, it was just ah fuck you and trying to just kind of kill the guy who just tried to kill me <laughs> with, with, with a big big punch <laughs> so uh well I, I mean thinking about fighting during fighting is like, like uh, one of the surest way to get kind of to, to, to basically get your ass kicked yeah <laughs> yeah um, that's what that's why kamaru usman is a really is such a funny example because he always looks like he, he's thinking about what he should should hit you with like he's hmm now i'm going to try the uppercut <laughs> <laughs> it kind of stalks forward like hmm <laughs> um that's a funny point uh i'm gonna chat with a bunch of uh former college wrestlers and every time they start to have a discussion about something because they aren't all like friends that have been like friends for a long time they've become friends in the past couple of years so it's very interesting to hear them share experiences and find things out about each other and compare and contrast and something they talked about is like do you think about wrestling during your wrestling matches like are, are you are you having thoughts <laughs> are, are you actually you know conscious and uh most of them say no uh, and then one of them said, yeah, usually no, but then when I do start thinking that's when I lose, like I'll be tied up with someone and I'll be like, wow, I'm really in a wrestling match right now. And then he'll shoot on me and <laughs> I won't be able to react because I just, I got out of it. I got out of the flow where like, I'll smell something, I'll smell him and uh, I'll be like, oh, he, he smells kind of good. And that's when I'm out of it. Um, and other people <laughs> said like, oh, I couldn't stop <laughs> thinking during, during my wrestling matches. And I, I was thinking the whole time and it made me suck. Um, so it seems like the ideal is to not be thinking and just to be automatic and just to trust your training and let yeah, the muscle memory do like, its thing. 
you think about the weirdest thing during fighting. <laughs> during can't say I've ever smelled anyone during a match. I, I, that's mm. personal. <laughs> I've been my experience, but this guy must have smelled really good. <laughs> Sometimes you can see someone thinking or like, I can see them being like, what I can see what they're trying to set me up for. And I'm like, I'm going to, I can't wait to try this, <laughs> but it's weird moments like that. But I think like Frankie is probably when he gets hurt, he's just reacting. Like he's, there's no real thought. Like he's, it's total just reaction based for a while until the pace settles down. Um, but I think going back to him in general, one of the things that makes him tough outside of his, durability and persistence is his pace right like like Iggy was saying like uh when you're fighting through while you're being tired or people who can just push the pace longer and get you tired you seem to think they're tough because like it, it's like a grueling fight but one guy is much more tired than the other and Frankie always fought like that and that to one of your points is uh like I think ingrained from folk style wrestling in America like the Dan Gable mentality was like, we're going to be tougher than people and we're going to beat them by wearing them out. And I mean, they were good. They were all really good wrestlers, but they weren't like the most technical wrestlers. They weren't known for that. They were just like the most in your face, going to push the pace and make you quit. And mm-hmm. I was thinking when we were talking about that, like wrestling practice practices, once in a while, we would do these uh, you know, like shark tank shark bait drills where the whole point is to like push you to your like have you break like you're we're gonna see how tough you are but you're we are gonna push you to a point where you're gonna break like you're gonna stop you're not gonna so and i wonder why do they actually do that why why would that be a good thing to actually get them to break not just push them very hard but actually get them to break and be like i can't move that's to your. I think that's to your point about toughness being kind of um, uh, uh, this misconception of toughness as being this really negative thing. Uh, like, uh, like Hack said, it's uh, too negative when it should be positive, and people think that if you break, then you you you'll be able to better withstand that situation when you actually break in, in the real life situation, which right. doesn't really happen. I don't think it's a thing. Yeah, I agree. I think I agree. But you're just gonna experience. Uh, like you're gonna break and then you're gonna think oh this this fucking sucks i don't want to break and then you break and then oh fuck this and just uh, kind of quit <laughs> i'll pass it to hacks in one second just to weigh in on that really quickly uh for, first of all to what you just said to him and uh that is something that people have theorized about tyron woodley is that he doesn't necessarily have cardio issues but he's felt what it's been like to be gassed in a fight before and he said no don't want that don't want to be there. So he's actively tried to avoid it and it hindered his style. And I think that's definitely a thing is when you've been, we talked about like going through a war, like how in experiencing sports related trauma, some people, you know, they, they, they experience and they say, you know, I can, I could do that again. And some people say, no, I don't want to do that ever again. I mean, that's um, but just I think a it response to on, trauma yeah, <laughs> that's in general, in general. <laughs> but it's I think it avoid- depends on your level. So if you're a professional athlete and you've been competing for a long time, that doesn't need to happen to you. Um, you. You know, you know yourself very well. Um, you just need to be prepared as best you can to make sure you're in good shape and you're healthy and, and, and technically prepared. They don't need to be testing your your mentality anymore at that point. But I think we're kind of if you're a beginner, I think that's gonna be an important thing to learn what you are able to endure. That happened to me. Um, one of the most important things that ever happened in my life was starting wrestling because I didn't think I was tough at all. Um, I thought you know that I was like a pushover and like a wimp and a baby. And I am, but not in every sense. Like I, I confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> but I went, I, I got to these, these practices and I was a fish out of water, man. I, I was totally out of shape. Like not even, not even in terms of wrestling, just overall didn't know a thing I was doing. It was in these super tough practices. My coach, uh, Zach, you know, I'm Nate Walker. I was putting us through like college style workouts and he, he was always bragging like, Oh, we're the best conditioned team in the district. And like, we get pinned in the first period. doesn't matter how good <laughs> our conditioning is, but our practices were really brutal. Um, and you know, a lot of people quit and I didn't quit, uh, during practices or during the season. And I was really proud of that. And I was really proud of each of those individual days, uh, when I just went through fucking shitty, times where i'm like this sucks so bad but i don't know why i didn't stop but i just didn't and that taught me that i can do a lot more than i knew i could 
Um, and that was very important for my for my confidence and my development. But I just think it totally depends person to person if that's something that's that you need um, or if that's if you've been there before. Um, but if you're a college level athlete, I don't if you're a division one athlete, I don't see the point in doing that. Like, there's no way you haven't been tested before. Like, you know what you can do. Stop. It, it's a I, I put it in the chat. Uh, one time it happened to us. It was a punishment. And he's like, we're going to have you go through this really terrible practice. So you don't want it to happen again. It's like a, it's a negative reinforcement. No, it's a positive yeah. punishment rather. It's like, you don't want this, avoid this. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, I think we're segueing towards the, back to the idea of- uh, Also remember the be told. Yeah, and uh, uh, one thing, and also kind of related to that is um, the idea of relying on your attributes and on your conditioning rather than your skill set. Like I'm pretty sure the worst thing that's ever happened to me is learning that I can take a shot <laughs> and I can, can kind of hit hard. So <laughs> basically it's, it hamstrung my training for a really long time. <laughs> just knowing that I can just kind of rely on, on big punch. <laughs> but I so, think, I think endurance is different than like being able to take a punch because if you have great endurance, you can use that as a weapon against yeah. people. Yeah, putting the uh, place on people. I think I think I actually know some people who fight much differently than they train, and I'm pretty confident it's because they're afraid to get tired in the fight. But Axe, yes. what did you want to say? Sorry, man. <laughs> uh, I, I was just gonna a, a wonderful conversation I had with the missus. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously she's pretty close to certain like um, American wrestling programs from her time, like studying in the US and. Uh, I'm never going to forget a conversation I had where she said like something along the lines of she was she was talking to somebody I won't say who but they competed at a very high level they were good enough to recognize how good the the Russians were and the conversation basically went like this you know uh, he's this was before Sadulev kind of appeared on the scene she loves reminding me that this was a prescient conversation and that the the, uh, the American wrestling question basically said you know one thing that kind of scares me about American wrestling is that our, our toughness is, is so built on we out-train everybody that we kind of program our fighters to think we can't be out-trained by anyone else. The problem is this. What happens when they come across um, somebody in the Russian system or in the Dagestani system that is as athletically gifted as our athletes? Because all other factors being equal, Russian fighters are probably, wrestlers are probably slightly less athletically gifted because their system prioritizes certain other things, but also has the technical sophistication that we're not teaching our guys because we, we preference different things. Because you watch what's going to happen. Our best American wrestler is going to wrestle with that guy and he's going to try and use his athleticism and he's going to realize that the athleticism is just being checked or at least controlled by superior technique. And then he's going to realize the Russian guy is even more athletic than he is. It's going to be like in a horror movie. If you've just escaped Jaws, you've got onto the water and then the shark decides to grow legs. <laughs> it's like the, uh, <laughs> the wake-up call that a lot of you see it a lot in the transition from college to international competition, not just the stylistic difference of training, but also folk style to freestyle is that freestyle is so much more finesse based because you can create points very quickly and in folk style, you get to the legs. There's a lot that can happen between you getting to the legs and points being declared uh, when it's officially a takedown or whatever is going to happen there in freestyle. I can get to your legs and you hit like a head pinch or a chest wrap off that and get a quick exposure off that, and I finished the takedown, I outscored you in that situation. Uh, so all the things that Americans are taught through their entire uh, wrestling careers, if they're not cross-training between styles, uh, is shattered pretty quickly uh, with this styles. And if the training approach too, like trying to run through walls and, and out cardio people and volume people and do all these things, like it's a much better approach for folk style than it is for freestyle because we're so in our bubble a lot of the time so it's that too and I think that's definitely influenced the uh the training philosophy and it's weird that um in MMA you we're now you know these these past couple of years we're studying uh you know these these Russian regional organizations a lot more like ACA formerly ACB and like uh, WCFA and, and all those guys and uh the caucuses and all these Georgian fighters coming over too and it's so funny because the Georgian athletes are much more like Americans than like the uh, you know the Ossetians or, or Dagestanis, it's, like uh, the they're very of, uh, similar to us. <laughs> it's yeah, it's funny the amount of exposure to, 
to Soviet institutions of training and uh, the Soviet approach to training, which is much stronger in uh, the Caucasus regions, but mm -hmm. in Ossetia and uh, in Ossetia and Dagestan and versus Georgia. So I guess it's a kind of a the result of that. Plus, uh, I think while we're at it, uh, while we're discussing training. Yeah, that was a bit tangential. You go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, many people also have this idea that uh, if you are from a particular region, then you're built different and you're tough to the point about uh, like uh, the Caucasus region athletes. And uh, also while we're at it, uh, I should point out that basically any mid mid tier random Russian regional fighter can basically wipe out any fighter in something like, for example, Kambata Americas, <laughs> something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that has to do a lot with uh, the base that they have, like the approach to training that they have and the, the availabil availability of sporting facilities. And uh, a lot of people think about toughness as um, like, the worse your conditions are, then the, the, the more tough you are, the more tougher you are because you live in a shithole <laughs> and uh, have, have experienced like immense emotional and physical turmoil. And like, I mean, sure, I live in the steppes. I've been exposed to, I live in a fucking field <laughs> in the village in the middle of nowhere. Like, and I've been exposed to a lot of like violence over the years growing up here particularly as a child even because i was born in the 90s and uh, i mean i don't think it's it's made me more resistant to stress if anything i'm more i'm more likely to just kind of avoid all that stuff altogether and that's to, to the point about uh, reactions to trauma in general like uh, avoidance behavior is probably the most common reaction to trauma as opposed to just kind of doubling doubling down on uh, toughing it out, so to speak. So uh, uh, where I'm going, uh, where was I going with this? I'm, I think I want to make a point about um, the misconception that in order to become better and in order to become more tougher, you have to experience stress and you have to experience uh, uh, violence, experience uh, hardship and suffering or that Someone who didn't experience these things in life, someone like from a fairly privileged background, for example, like the co most common uh, reaction to when they when, when people are faced with a person like that, oh, he's a wimp. He just grew up with a silver spoon up his ass, and so he he inherently isn't able to ex exhibit any uh, any durability or mental fortitude or whatever the fuck. So. Uh, and back to the point about toughness being something that you can teach people uh, with the right approach you can basically teach people anything everything is a skill i, I, I mean uh, kind of like with the example of uh, like uh, punching power being something that you're born with it's uh, it's a diff it's a sliding scale between nature and nurture uh, for example, Habib, Habib Nurmagomedov, everyone thinks about him like he's this, uh, like a Dagestani warlord from the mountains to just, it's just built different once again. And, uh, that's why he's so dominant. Uh, I don't think he's, he is that like compared to a lot of people who live in the Caucasus region, he's really kind of way more privileged than a lot of the people who live there. It's kind of a, a common comparison I like to make is that he's kind of like a princeling. His, uh, his father was a very prominent sporting figure and he's had a lot of ties to the uh, Dagestani government and uh, the Chechen government and just basically prominent Caucasus figures because sports is a very respected uh, career choice in that region. And so naturally, uh, Habib was able to gain access to a lot of the training facilities, to a lot of the best equipment, to a lot of the best training partners, basically. And so uh, is, he, is he less tough because he grew up in this privileged background? Fuck no. He's, uh, he's an incredibly, like, uh, he's, uh, what's the word? I guess he's kind of a hard man. <laughs> he's been molded into this hard, harsh person who is uh, very easily able to push past uh, certain uh, thresholds that uh, many that would break many other people and 
Yeah, and this uh, ties to the point about uh, the differences between the training systems in, like, for example, Russia and America. So I, I think you can take it from here. <laughs> like a, yeah. a, a very rambly segue. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly, I think background doesn't isn't necessarily indicative of any of anything. Uh, it is it is interesting, like. Uh, from how you ended in, in Hax's comment, like how much, because your physical attributes, you shouldn't rely on them, but you should certainly tailor your game to have those advantages be in play. Uh, and how much do you rely on them, I think is a tricky thing. But I think the, the American folk style system is like heavily dependent on developing toughness which means you could probably teach it to someone i i, I kind of think it's like it's it's uh somewhat equivalent to like teaching someone confidence or something like that like it's it's like uh it's just a matter of believing something that you're capable of and then not being dissuaded in in the face of adversity right mm -hmm. i don't know there's like dozens of different theories from different sciences that you could apply here um, and I think one of the issues that coaches often you know a mistake that they make is they go to like pop psychology rather than exercise science which is should be the one that they're looking at because they're athletic coaches um, what we talked about uh, like shark tank and uh, I, I wrote in the chat that my my version of that in high school for wrestling was uh, was the grind match where they said, we're going to have you wrestle live for two hours. Um, and it was a punishment. And it was like, here's your toughness. Um, go through this terrible, terrible, terrible experience. It's going to make you hate wrestling. Um, but if you get through it, uh, you're, you can do anything. Um, in, in a psychological perspective, that would probably be called flooding. Um, which is uh, used to deal with phobias most, most likely. Uh, I don't think that's the most effective approach. There's usually a more progressive approach to dealing with phobias where you expose someone little by little and, and, and ramp it up. And, it's you kind know, of you like progressive overload. In it's, that's, that's what I was going to get to. It's, it's progressive overload. Same as with exercise science, with weightlifting. That is a very logical approach to learning or building on anything. And if you are not doing that to build toughness or confidence or whatever, you're probably doing it wrong. And the odds of success are random. And if it works, it's probably by accident, um, which is so applicable uh, to the chaotic nature of training in America and the chaotic nature of training in MMA. And that's why I think the fighters that we do see succeed are kind of special. Uh, they're kind of outliers that they succeed in spite of the chaotic nature of the training environment. Um, and that's why we, we see the people that we do. So, you know, a training system that's not really optimized in terms of technique or skill development, not really optimized in terms of strength and, and conditioning. It's also kind of but probably uh, tied... optimized in terms of the people that we have. I think that they're very mentally strong people. I think it's also board. tied to the culture of with the cultural obsession with the idea of an underdog. Like you were tying back yeah. to my previous point about uh, thinking that the shittier your conditions are, then the better you are as a person. Rocky got the shit beat out of him and he was poor. And he was ugly. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter that he was a, a terrible, terrible boxer. <laughs> 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 he, he pulled through his tough. He went the distance. Yeah, That's the only real Rocky it's... movie. The rest are uh, fan fiction. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> and uh, yeah, before Hax gets really bored, I wanted to point out that. Um, uh, Soviet style of training is kind of like exposure therapy in a sense. Mm -hmm. So basically, you are exposed to more scenarios uh, against different tra training partners in different uh, competition situations against uh, different styles. And the more you are you are exposed to these things, the more comfortable you are with them. It's really more about comfort rather than ability to push through mm -hmm. stuff. Like you're comfortable with, with the knowledge that you have faced things like this before in a controlled environment. So with the proper training, you should be able to handle this situation properly in a, in a correct and uh, comprehensive manner. So yeah, Hax, take, your, take it away. I mean, part <laughs> of this is a theory on us. <laughs> part of this is all about like incentives though isn't it like one reason that the if you like let's call it the post-soviet system you know 
it, it has a much bigger place in its institutions in training you know in connecting sports let's let's say sports excellence with political power in using sports as a method to even particularly in the Caucasus to moderate shall we say people of strong religious convictions there are so many different ways in which if you're a high level sports person and you're relatively analytical in the way that you think about sports you can earn a living you can be successful and those those I suppose, places have been created for the athletes. So not only does that kind of incentivize, you know, wanting your athletes to be a little bit more thinky because thinky equals coach equals good investment, but because the, again, let's call it the post-Soviet system kind of doesn't just see a fighter a fighter or a wrestler as, okay, well, you're going to wrestle for us or you're going to fight for us for a very short amount of time because our system's quite disconnected and ad hoc and chaotic as like Ed has said, you know, look at like, you know, in, in the Soviet system, if you're, and I'm talking now particularly about the Soviet system, if you were seen as an athletic talent that could represent the USSR, you were coached by pretty much a top level system from the beginning to the end. But if you're a, as I understand, if you're a high level American wrestler, you know, state, then probably NCAA, then like America, this, lots of different systems and they all might have very different philosophies or approaches and how to get the most out of you. So, you know, that kind of creates a system where you want to train your employees to last a long time. You don't want to just burn through their athleticism to get that one gold medal or those three NCAA Div 1 championships. You want them to last. You want them to be something other than a husk when they're no longer capable of winning your titles. And Mm -hmm. that I think is reflected through the improved, shall we say, on average technical sophistication of post-Soviet and Soviet athletes, but also the fact that they just burn themselves out, not nearly as quickly. Like, I don't think, I think if you had a fighter like Sadulev, he probably, the American system, all other factors being equal, would probably have leaned a lot more on his athleticism than trying to take the long route and build technique that would enhance that athleticism. Mm-hmm. I have a question for Zach. You just made me think of something, Hats. Um, since there seems to be so much in common, Zach, have you noticed that uh, you've been in a lot of MMA gyms? How big is the influence of American wrestlers on on the structure of MMA gyms? Because I feel like, given the success American wrestlers had right away as soon as the UFC was developed in North America, uh, I, I feel like fighters <clears throat> at large and people interested in fighting at large, you know, people talk about the Gracies and Jiu Jitsu and all of that, and maybe that's one camp, but I feel like they quickly recognized the dominant athletic force in in MMA was was wrestlers. So. Is that a thing? Did they really ingrain a lot of these methods into the camps? Or do you think it's more a question of, is there a wrestler in the camp to, to provide the influence today? You mean like like the way they train or? Yeah, is the coaching, I mean, it, I know there isn't any structured, you know, consistent coaching philosophy across gyms, but do you feel like you've seen a lot of gyms where a lot of stuff is based on wrestling? Yeah, I mean, like I would say most of the gyms I've been to, the pro training sessions are run pretty similar to like a collegiate wrestling practice mm-hmm. where you know but but the, the weird thing about mma is like we the pros do the pro training but then they go to some of the general classes and the general classes are much more like a typical jujitsu gym where right. it's, the training isn't quite structured and uh built around pushing yourself and developing athleticism all with the technique together it's just like hobbyists here's a technique do whatever you want if you want to roll or whatever so it's like it, it's a weird mix it's a weird <laughs> mix the, the, the pro only sessions i've been to at multiple gyms are fairly similar to what collegiate wrestling practices are mm-hmm. and that was that was what that one one of the ideas i had to write about was like the idea of like big camp versus small camp like more like a isolated like boxers training camp how they approach it versus like the average MMA camp, which is much more like the idea of like going through like a collegiate wrestling practice system where it's much less specifically focused, but you have a lot of training partners, a lot of, uh, a lot of athletic development versus like this narrow couple partners, but highly specific coaching idea. You know, that was one of the things I wanted to explore with something, which I may write at some point, but later not today not on this podcast but eventually we need to talk about strength and conditioning because i feel like that's an entirely different beast 
uh, and uh, training in training. general would be an interesting <laughs> topic. And yeah, Hex brought up an interesting distinction. Like he said, post-Soviet system as opposed to Soviet system, and it's really it's very important because, for example, Fyodor Emelianenko he never really had a really like a world-class gym. He never trained at a world-class gym, and uh, he like he started training in the '90s after finishing uh, finishing his samba career, and so his training really was kind of ramshackle. So it's kind of reflective of the situation in Russia in, in general at the time. And uh, the Russian system really isn't kind of like as comprehensive as the Soviet system, because I see more and more influence at the gyms and how uh, local athletes train, more influence from uh, American culture, stuff like cross, CrossFit and stuff like, uh, stuff like that. That's unfortunate. And, yeah, and it, <laughs> it's... it's, it's, it's <laughs> I mean, not to be, not to completely shit all over the American system, but I mean, strength and conditioning, the way it trains strength and conditioning fucking sucks. It's, it's bizarre. It's bullshit. <laughs> and seeing Russian athletes train the same way, it's just kind of, it kind of makes me want to grind my teeth <laughs> to, 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 to find, to find dust. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's, it's uh, cringeworthy. <laughs> like I, I've been to a, the local MMA gym and, uh, they did a strength and conditioning session and it's all like it's all crossfit based and i just basically told them to fuck off mm -hmm. <laughs> and bailed and didn't train there anymore <laughs> and basically i'm trying like uh, with the uh, mma gyms in particular you have to be very careful about um, uh, avoiding gyms where strength and conditioning like this uh, has this crossfit base and has this uh, american based uh, mm -hmm. approach to strength and conditioning so it's it's a money maker. Uh, it's a money maker. Yeah. Hold yeah. the can of worms there. Um, Hax, you go ahead. But before you go ahead, I, I want to work towards wrapping this up because it's, it's, it's been a while and people have short attention spans. Although the people who are listening to an hour and a half, whatever this is already, maybe they're special. Uh, but still, they're just probably for, uh, listen. They're extra listen tough. To extra tough. <laughs> they, they just, getting through this podcast is, is a demonstration of toughness. But I do want to work towards wrapping it up. So, uh, Hax, you go ahead. And if anyone has uh, you know, concluding thoughts about, you know, things they've been able to collect for themselves through all this conversation because i don't know what my takes are until i have a full conversation i don't know if you guys are like that so you know hopefully we can get some good uh solid framework down although tuman you, you found your definition like 20 minutes in so good for you um you go ahead ask. <laughs> that's funny because i like i actually kind of had two points that i think would have been good for concluding i mean the first one i think is there's a lot of bro science in mixed martial arts and there's a lot of bro science in combat sports, shall we say, that are beyond a single stream. And a lot of that is reflective of the fact that, you know, um, MMA is young. Like we don't have a generation of MMA fighters who are really handling um, CTE. We have a couple of notable examples, but even then it's pretty easy to write it off because it's like, oh, well, they didn't really know how to fight anyway. They just kind of walked in at the start. Gary Goodridge, which makes me angry because he deserves better than that. The second thing I would, would, would kind of say is I think at least to some degree, MMA has a big overlap with anti-intellectualism. Um, you can kind of see that in the, shall we say, political positioning of organizations like the UFC, but you can also kind of see that in that a lot of the feeder streams into uh, mixed martial arts, you know, are things like American wrestling and a lot of the way in which strength and conditioning is taught is bro science. You know, anti-intellectualism doesn't just have to be fuck facts. I like my feelings. These are my traditions. Anti-intellectualism can be teaching and training in ways that aren't based on evidence. That's pretty anti-intellectual. So uh, yeah, maybe as like a, as a concluding wrapping point, I would say that toughness you know it's important i think to be as precise as possible when we talk about something like toughness because every time we don't we're just kind of playing in systems where you know you have mma gyms or you have wrestling gyms that are like you know you're in searing pain in your back your performance has been falling off for the last three or four weeks but you know stop arguing with me you pussy push through it push through the pain that's that kind of way of thinking about toughness and what's good toughness and what's attainable toughness is just going to leave us with a generation of broken athletes that can't do much with their life and that's not only tragic that's a pretty big fucking moral problem mm -hmm. yeah it's bad bad toughness is something we didn't talk about that much 
but just the misconception of what it is. And, and I think that is something we talked about a little bit of, of the perception of toughness. We've touched upon it. Enduring uh, pain. Multiple times during you, the podcast. So, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> but what we didn't conclude off of it is, you know, how it presents a problem uh, with, you know, with the structure of MMA and the organization of MMA with uh, corners refusing to, to throw in the towel, uh, you know, refusing to end fights. We saw like Calvin Cater versus... Max Holloway, for example, that was a, probably a life-altering beating, not the first life-altering beating someone's taken from Max Holloway, where it was over at least a full round, like in the Ortega example, it was over in the third round, but it went another one um, where he took even more punishment, I think. I, I might be getting my rounds wrong, but a full round happened in between the fight being decisively over because his camp believed he could still pull it out because they know their guy and they know that he can. he's a, capable of these things, but you look at a boxing match where that's probably the same situation where the boxer could definitely pull something out, but is it worth it? Is it worth it to take the, to risk your, your fighter's health? And in MMA, they always say, yes, it is always worth it uh, to try to win. And Hacks talked about incentives before it's because of the pay structure, but a lot of things that we're not going to get into, but I think part of it is, is the, uh, I'm going to use a word that's going to make everyone hate me. Uh, toxic max- masculinity in a way is, you know, it's like, we're not going to quit. We're not going to throw on the towel because this is not what we do. And I think that might be part of it as well. I'm not sure they're always thinking that far ahead into it's, uh, it being yeah, it, uh, an economic thing. It might just be pride. A lot of it is just based in uh, the cultural kind of uh, like uh, cultural things. <laughs> What's the word? I forgot the forgot the word uh cultural things works i get it yeah i guess <laughs> yeah sure and uh yeah with the way uh, to summarize uh where i was going with everything i've said is that a lot of misconceptions about toughness and the definition of toughness in general is kind of uh really based in uh well hacks would like me to say institutions and i would also like to would like to say culture and uh Culturally, for example, uh, I've uh, like, for example, to compare, like, I guess a more civilized place with Russia, <laughs> I, you wouldn't meet, meet as many people uh, in that country, in, in, in a Western country, for example, as a, uh, who have had to deal with street violence, domestic violence. Uh, like political corruption, uh, institutional violence, like for, for example, by, uh, well, the police. Like uh, to bring up an anecdote from my personal experience, uh, just when I lived in Moscow, uh, I was returning from my job and uh, a, a police car drove past me and uh, waved me over. So uh, they wanted to kind of take me on a ride because I looked like someone they were uh, like, uh, someone they were uh, searching for and uh, turns out I really didn't but <laughs> that's beside the point <laughs> they basically took me in uh, and started interrogating me and uh, basically they just kicked 10 shits out of me and uh, and, uh, it's, uh, and then uh, an investigator came in and said this is the wrong guy we're searching for a for a person from the Caucasus region <laughs> and like he didn't say you, you idiots, why did you beat him up? He said, uh, you idiots, we were searching for, for, for another guy to beat up. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, that's beside the point. But yeah, uh, where, where was I uh, going with this? Ah, um, I wouldn't culture. say, yeah, it's, yeah, culture. It's, uh, it's a really common occurrence in here. Like, you, like everyone uh, has been exposed to violence over here at some point or another. But I do not think that's really made uh, the Russian populace in general kind of more uh, tough in the general sense or more able to to oppose govern- government violence, let's say. Because, for example, like if you look at the way the current Russian populace operates, the current you know, political uh, situation uh, works out is that the government does whatever it wants and no one really does anything with it. Like you don't see protests all the time in, in the streets uh, for example as opposing like uh, any particular laws or anything like that meanwhile in a country where the populace have, hasn't been really exposed to such uh, to, to a such degree of governmental violence and institutional violence uh, 
they freely come out into the streets and say, fuck you, we, we don't want this, give us, uh, the be- give us better conditions and all that stuff. And so it's kind of um, reflective of the general misconception that toughness is, a, is an expression of, a, uh, is a, an extension of durability, physical durability and ability to take punishment. It's really not that. And um, um, about, uh, to summarize the idea about of uh, training someone to be tough, uh, it's really more about discipline and composure, I, I, I would think. That's my current idea of it right now, in that you can gradually build it up with positive reinforcement as opposed to just, like, like you said, flooding a person with uh, this negative experience, with this horrific, horrible thing. <laughs> like, like it's supposed to make, him, make the person uh, more able to handle it. Mm-hmm. Like for example, I got beat up by cops. Do you think I'm I'm will- more willing to beat them beat them up? <laughs> like, <laughs> fuck no! <laughs> I don't want to talk to them any like at all. I just avoid cops at all costs. Like avoid w- talking to them, interacting with them, and uh, all that stuff. So, uh, really, uh, building toughness and building a culture of toughness is more about. Uh, institutions really in the, in the end uh, like f- to compare the American system with the uh, Soviet or post Soviet system uh, I, I wouldn't say Russian athletes are less tough because they don't train as hard it's like uh, the results should speak for themselves and uh, so in order to uh, really like uh, we, I, th- I think we've said this in the beginning we really should rethink how we define toughness, how we approach toughness. And it's, uh, I mean, you said people would hate you for saying toxic masculinity, but it absolutely is a thing. They'd be stupid to deny that. I mean, how many, how many bros have you seen that, that uh, just end up doing stupid shit just to prove that they're, they're the men, they're the chat? Uh, uh, I, I, th- I was building up to something really smart. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you feel better. It's been very smart the whole time. Uh, uh, nah. It's not reassuring. I, sh- I, sh- I should have pre- <laughs> prepared better. But, uh, it's a podcast, yeah. man. You don't prepare. <laughs> I prepare for my podcast. So. Um, yeah, that's I think your, that's uh, your post Soviet system at work. You know, we're Americans, yeah. we wing it. <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think uh, to avoid any more like uh, broad, uh, b- broad stereotyping, uh, which I think this warrants, this podcast warrants a second part where we, where we examine the cultural and uh, institutional ties to the definitions of toughness and various other concepts in training. Uh-huh. Um, mm. But I think we've done a pretty good, pretty decent job, I, I should think. Uh, at, at least I <laughs> managed to come up with it in my personal definition of toughness. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's usable. The insights are, are all across the podcast. If you're looking <laughs> for one place to find the, the good insights, you're, you're out of luck. You're going to have to listen to the whole thing. I mean, uh, Zach, so, what as do, an what intro, do you take away works. from this whole experience? Sorry, Tim. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. What did you say? What's your takeaway from uh, this discussion? Uh, How would you summarize it? I enjoyed it. I think uh, a, a secondary podcast with the uh, cultural ideas coming more into it would be interesting i don't know what i would have to add to that probably not much um as far as what we discussed i think i like my definition from the beginning generally state uh stands i think for me but with uh with uh the ideas like it is highly dependent on different variables and like specifics like hacks said in the beginning and that there are like obviously good toughness and bad toughness and and it's, it's just it's just a uh, highly dependent on the person and the situation and and isn't consistent over time so i don't know you nailed I it the first time ax what's up what do you what do you have to say i'm gonna close the show when you're done I wanted to say something. Fine. <laughs> and then two minutes, and then I'll close the show. Yeah, I would I would just kind of reinforce what everyone else has, has said. I think 
there doesn't need to be there doesn't need to be any concrete changes to like Zach's starting definition. Just we've kind of established why you need to apply some nuance um, in in assessing it. And maybe that's the biggest takeaway for me. It's good to have these definitions of toughness. It's good to recognize that there's no one size fits all definition. And I think it's good to recognize that, like, try and be more specific than just toughness, mental toughness, body toughness, five round toughness, losing tough, whatever. But I think the bigger picture is try and take away an analytical system for evaluating what this word means. Be, be specific, be precise, but also be prepared to change your mind because MMA is so full of stupid bullshit, even when it's at a high level because it's just such a weird sport. You should expect your definition of toughness to get challenged on the regular. Yeah, context matters. Nuanced thinking and uh, nuanced thinking and approaching the context really matters. And uh, yeah, uh, you can argue semantics for however long you want to argue about them it's it really doesn't matter in the end much like it, it pays more about um it pays more in the sense to it really pays more to think uh it pays more to think <laughs> 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 yeah uh the fuck did i want to say <laughs> what, what, what is it with me oh i guess i'm okay hung over and uh, didn't get much sleep but anyway uh, uh, the specificity with which you approach these topics really uh, it's, it's really the deciding factor and uh, uh, having this I mean we always hammer this uh, try to hammer this point home in everything we've, we've put out so far as a website collectively as an analysis hub, is that systematic thinking is really the way to go just no other way around it just and uh, really when approaching things like definitions and uh your own personal convictions you really should it pays more to approach it with a bit of a scientific scientific type thinking in a sense like uh, not trying to prove yourself right but trying to be less wrong little by little every time i guess that's my concluding uh, uh, statement think more <laughs> Just think. Just try it every once in a while. It, it's cool. It's fun. I think you got it. You got your big takeaway there. Yeah. Um, you should, like, <laughs> my takeaway is that brain. you should use your brain. <laughs> and I should use my brain more and not, <laughs> and not do stuff like get shit-faced at 6 a.m. <laughs> before recording big podcasts. Using, using your brain doesn't sound too tough. I don't know sound too tough. <laughs> Uh, it's tough after you've got got hit in the head a bunch so <laughs> i'm exhibiting my own toughness by uh, trying to use my brain after it's been scrambled so many times <laughs> listen achieving the bare minimum even if it's the bare minimum is an accomplishment and it is toughness if it is difficult for you and that is the definition of courage is doing something that scares you even though it scares you and doing something that is hard for you even if it's a very easy thing that's what makes you tough and that is my definition. Just kidding. But uh, yeah, I, I think we we had so many great points and this is such a broad term. Yeah, wait. We dug so deep into it and you have so, more. You got something. Your yeah. brain's working. The uh, gears are yeah. turning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, before uh, anyone, before the listener thinks that we're talking about uh, that uh, the only takeaway about this is related to combat sports, it's really not. Uh, for Like... The very reason is that uh, toughness, well, it's a, it's a really broad topic and anyone can exhibit toughness in the right circumstances. Being a doctor requires you to be tough because learning to be one takes for upwards of, what, 10 years? And even then it can prove futile because you then have to apply all that knowledge in practice with people who are often mistrustful of you because they do not possess the knowledge you have. Not to mention the long hours, the daily exposure to suffering, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And same deal with teachers who have to deal with unruly children, uncooperative students, ungrateful parents, and the usually institutionally dismissive attitude. Uh, many people ca usually carry towards educators and education as a whole. So basically anti-intellectualism. And uh, yeah, like, like you said, the simplest things uh, are also can be uh, an exhibition on uh, an example of exhibiting toughness. Like... Working a nine to five that that is an extremely soul crushing an extremely soul crushing job is, is, is it's 
tough as all hell <laughs> and generally sticking to your own principles usually is tough and sticking to your principles in the wake of the current information era where you, we we can often be overloaded with information and uh, all this like um, all these uh, all this alternative t uh, facts uh, sort of stuff and uh, the general like chaos of living in the modern era and living in the age of loneliness to reference <laughs> the MMA fighting in the age of loneliness film mm -hmm. but yeah uh, I guess your takeaway uh, a listener's takeaway from this it should be in a sense you are tough as well if you listen to this whole thing you're, you're tough as hell man you, you got you got, <laughs> some, you got some grit in you <laughs> to make it this far <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think something that I'm definitely going to take away from this is every fight where I see a toughness angle, I'm going to try to bring it up. You can hear that uh, on the Fight Sites MMA podcast. You can definitely hear that in the Wrestling for MMA podcast, which I'm also on. You hear a lot of me if you're going <laughs> to be listening to Fight Site content, so get used to it. Um, but yeah, I, I just feel that um, in general, my goal for this, this panel was to... Uh, you know, de demystify a little bit the concept uh, because a lot of the time, you know, we, we talked about, can it be taught? Is it a skill? Are you built different? Is it inherent? What, what is it? Uh, and I think we all kind of agree that it's something that can be done with scaffolding and, and progressive overload and something that can be built like anything else um, under the right circumstances. And you don't have to be psychotic or, you know, lose your humanity to be a person who yeah, everything can is a, a skill. be tough. Exactly. Everything is a skill. Just be, be consistent. Yeah, it, it, it just takes, takes work. Um, and take, working take hard time. is tough. You know, look at Zach Makowski, hardest working guy I know. Uh, extremely, extremely tough to pull that off. So uh, <laughs> that that's my, that's what, one of my big things here is that being I, I'm Zach always Makowski looking. Is tough. <laughs> yeah, being <laughs> Zach is, is one of the toughest things you can do. Uh, but <laughs> being, being yourself, uh, we're just rambling at this point. Uh, but yeah, I, I just think that um, I'm always trying to push my narratives of, of nurture uh, being a little stronger than nature in, in so many different instances and people always have these wrong ideas and it's going to help you understand so many things to, to get used to thinking in, in this way if you're not a person that's used to unpacking things and digging in, into all the potential nuances so this is just one vehicle for that kind of discussion we're going to do this a lot um so, yeah. so get ready for that it's going to be rambly and disorganized and it's going to be fun and we're going to well, figure out uh, things by accident and it's just going to be a, a fun ride going <laughs> back to the very first example of gsp being yourself is tough mm -hmm. being yourself against all odds is really tough so uh good job everyone <laughs> yeah yeah you made it you made it all right uh one last thing is uh congratulations to us and to all of you uh, for helping us reach our, I forgot to say it in the beginning, for helping us reach our Patreon goal of 200 patrons. That's a huge deal. Uh, we only started doing this, what, let, like a year and a half ago, started the, the Patreon account. Uh, and you guys have responded really well. And we're really thankful for everyone that supported us uh, this whole time. And we're, it's only going up from here. Um, but yeah, it, to reward you for your patronage, we are now going to release the, uh, the top five series and the, and the best UFC fights of all time and the commentary videos. So articles and videos, we're going to do one a week to give some people time to finish those. Uh, but we have, we have enough that we can do one a week now uh, and you're going to get them and they're really good. And it's going to be so much fun. And those are all fights that exemplify toughness. Oh my God, this was completely by accident. This is such a perfect precursor for those fights. Wow. You should listen to this before you watch those. Uh, you're already, you've already done it. Um, hopefully you didn't read any of those articles or watch any of those fights yet because this would be a great point to jump into those from or, or vice versa. Uh, it's going to apply so well, but I'm not going to spoil what the fights are. Although we definitely talked about at least one of them here. Uh, but yeah, this was so awesome. Uh, this is probably my favorite podcast we've ever recorded that I've ever been a part of um no surprise considering the cast we have here so really thank you to you guys uh for making it happen uh, and for showing oh, up shucks being tough uh and oh, sharing shucks. your experiences and uh being being smart guys and uh i appreciate it and we'll, we'll be back with another one soon